If our previous speaker provides education at the graduate level, then our next speaker focuses on the beginning levels of undergraduate education. Uh, she brings students into environmental studies, excites and inspires their interests, and gives them a solid background from which to build. Assistant Professor Jackie Klatchner teaches and researches at Central Wyoming College's Department of Environmental Health and Safety, where she trains students at the associate's level in environmental technology. From there, students go on to complete a bachelor's degree at UW or other universities, or they go into industry in Wyoming, often the energy in industry, where they work in environmental safety, testing, and compliance. Jackie is a leader at CWC for undergraduate research experiences during their early years of higher education. Drawing on her 10 years of experience as a Knowles leader, Professor Klastner's courses regularly provide students with an in-the-field experience engaging in research and data collection, which they then take back to the campus and analyze. These activities are part of CWC's strong emphasis on undergraduate research, uh, for it is the only Wyoming community college that belongs to the 35-member consortium of the Community College Undergraduate Research Initiative. And if I was if I didn't say this next part, I would be ignore my responsibilities as a UW professor. Uh, just to point out the interconnectedness of this work, uh, science is expensive. I mean, can you imagine how much it costs Matt to just collar all those deer and track their migrations and so on? Um, a lot of Jackie's research uh, is supported in part by funding opportunities, and those funding opportunities are brought into Wyoming by the University of Wyoming uh, and distributed and made available through there. And, and I've noticed from, from some of uh, uh, the write-ups of her research that she draws uh, on a lot of the different opportunities that we provide. So with that last little thing, let me introduce Professor uh, Jackie Klatchner. And since my title for her talk doesn't have anything to do with what's up there, I will simply invite you to welcome uh, <laughs> Professor Jackie Klatchner. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks to the National Museum of Wildlife Art and uh, to all of the associates at UW, Susan Tuline, CWC here in, in Jackson. So um, indeed, if Matt emphasized where students go at the graduate, the doctoral, the research professional level, I get them at an entirely different phase of their exploratory mission. They're green. They're endlessly enthusiastic. Some of them are powerhouses, academically, intellectually, and physically, and uh, shame me at times. But I get the delight of having uh, early minds in their research careers to nurture. And the tale that I would like to tell, and it is a tale, it's a story of what I did with my summer vacation with an emphasis on scientific methodology and scientific research with uh, 17 undergraduate students is the story of the interdisciplinary climate change expedition. Our focus was to look at snow, water, ice, H2O and all its forms in respect to the Wind River glaciers, in particular the Dinwiddie Glacier, and in the context of changing climate, so changing temperatures, changing precip, and the implications that has for water use and some of the human prehistoric implications as well due to some surprise finds that we made when we were in the mountains. This was a 19-day expedition. We came out of the field at the end of August and rolled right into the semester, and so this is the first telling of this story. Uh, just quickly, a little bit of background on CWC. We're an open access to your community college. We have outreach in Lander. We're centered in Riverton. And we have outreach in Jackson and in Dubois. We cover Thermopolis in our service area as well. And as you heard earlier, undergraduate research isn't a given at the community college level. I so strongly believe that to be a good graduate student and to go on well into your research, either academically or professionally, you need to set that foundation early, that it has become a passion of mine to engage my students early and to give them the skills they need to go on. And also, an engaged and inspired studio, uh, student audience behaves extraordinarily well in the classroom. 
They will work endlessly hard for you if there's something they see that you can provide to them in terms of a greater experience. So the goal of my mission was to go on beyond simply going out in the field and citizen science. We wanted to collect meaningful scientific data. So what does that mean, meaningful scientific data? Well, it can have meaning to you as a researcher. It can have an emotional connection to you. But we wanted scientifically meaningful data that would stand up under peer review, maybe even allow these students to publish, and that came through working in collaboration with other institutions. That included the University of Wyoming, uh, Glenn Tootle, who's left the University of Wyoming and now is with the University of Alabama, and the University of North Dakota. So there's some behind the scenes collaborators with whom we discussed methodology and for whom we have provided data and with whom we will co-publish. So we really wanted this to be beyond a field trip or beyond citizen science, but to actually have meaningful, uh, method-worthy data. Furthermore, from the student end, I wanted to create meaning out of scientific data collection. So many students come to us terrified of taking a science class. And I have the joy of having two really uh, delightful fields to teach in. One is environmental science, which gives me all the opportunities in the world to discuss primary biological theories, evolution, adaptation, uh, right down to cell biology, but to place it in the context of the planet and with human involvement. And I have another key area of focus, which is geosp geospatial information science and technology, which is everything from global positioning systems to geographic information systems, from mapping on the ground to using computer systems to create maps, and extends into the realm of geophysical data collection as well. Uh, both of those skills collectively serve students really well in terms of academic advancement and employment. So they're, they're meaningful to me to teach, meaningful for them to advance professionally and academically. So objectives for this. I wasn't just looking for the easy targets. I wanted students who might be scared. I wanted students who thought, all I want to do is rock climb. All I want to do is mountaineer. That's all I want to do. And I'll teach at a camp in the summer, and I'll work at the ski lift in the winter. And that's fantastic. But I wanted those students desperately, because I was that student without a real niche in my undergraduate. I was at the University of Calgary in the field of geography. And I loved all that stuff, but nobody ever showed me how to combine scientific data collection, scientific methodology, employment, and these passions of mine to be in the backcountry. I'm not sure the field even of an environmental technician or environmental scientist really had evolved that much at that point. You either camped for a living professionally through Knowles, or you were maybe working in industry, or you worked in some in-town profession, but I didn't know how to merge those together. So in catching students, I wanted students from across every discipline, outdoor education, biology, environmental science, archaeology, associates planning to go on to a bachelor's, or an applied associates looking to finish and go to work. I wanted them all. I wanted to give them something technically that they could walk away from. Um, I'm the daughter of a superb mechanic who builds his own helicopters and fixes everything. And I'm a little bit technically terrified. So for me to tackle new skills and walk away with them and be comfortable is a great gift to me. And I wanted to be able to proffer that gift to my students and say, no, you won't just be familiar with this. You'll be good. You'll be very adept at handling a GPS and migrating that data into geographic information systems. You will turn on, collect the data, manage, store, and, and analyze uh, data from ground penetrating radar. Not just familiar, not watching from behind, but everybody uh, getting their hands on those skills. And I would say in the wilderness environment, because we're not working in the lab, we're on the Dinwiddie Glacier of the Wind River Range, these skills include rescue skills. They include climbing, they include roped glacier teams, they include first aid, risk mitigation, and staying warm and dry at 11,000 feet. So a lot of other skills in addition to uh, geotechnical, geospatial skills. And I wanted them to understand scientific methodology, where that begins. I wanted to take the concept of a literature review and say, does that scare you? That's OK. All it is is a chase. You're finding out what's been done on this topic how you can pursue it, 
and adding into that field of data. It's just a chase. It's a puzzle to figure out. And from there, tell me how you're going to do it. Think about your data and share it with the world. That's the scientific process and the scientific method. So I wanted to give them those skills. Um, we have this uh, lovely new site where students, even if the material has not been peer reviewed, the UW repository where students go on and publish, so they still are required to write up and analyze their data. It's not going to go through the Journal of Nature, but it requires them to go through all of the steps of scientific data research, data collection and analysis. And uh, all of my students will be required at the end of the year to publish on the UW repository. So a good story. If you're going to tell a good story, you need good characters. You need the protagonists. Okay. Ideally, happy, engaged students and inspired faculty. You need a setting. I am blessed to be in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, to work in the Wind River Range, to have access to the winds outside my back door. Through a decade working with Knowles, there's some places I know really well and some others that have gotten a little rusty. You need a theme. And if I tell my story right, the theme will be obvious and the protagonist's role in that theme will be clear. A plot, if you're going to be at 11,000 feet and you're going in the backcountry for 19 days, things will happen, whether you plan them or not. And the denouement, the wrap-up, where do we go from here and where do these students go? So my students, I highlighted Jake Urban as he's one of your own from Jackson, American uh, Mountain Guides Association, one of our faculty at CWC out in the field. Uh, outdoor ed students, I mentioned these. These were easy pickings for me because what we did was took a scientific module and embedded it in a course that was going to the winds, whether or not I planned and schemed and had students read articles, this course was going to the winds. We took a very tried and true course and shattered it. We added more faculty. We added grants. We had it an extra four days in the backcountry. We added uh, 300 extra pounds of food and 400 pounds of scientific film gear, uh, 12, nine pack horses and three mules and three rides, and took something very tried and true and exploded it in hopes of broadening student horizons and changing their trajectories. We brought in students from archaeology in hopes of tapping into a new field of archaeological research called ice patch archaeology. And as glaciers are receding, which our glaciers and the winds are doing, students are finding, researchers are finding, hikers are finding new evidence of historical, prehistorical uh, archaeological remnants in the winds. So we recruited some archaeology students. And of course, my baby is the environmental tech, environmental science program. I wanted students who were dual majored in these programs or who I could lure to dual major in these programs. Collectively, I didn't want them to be outdoor ed, archaeology, environmental science. I wanted them to be researchers. I wanted them to be able to say, I performed undergraduate research. I can put it on my resume. I understand what I did and how I got there. So collectively, they became our team of researchers. They were all fellowshipped. They were all paid to do their work. That was supported by National Science Foundation grants, EPSCOR and UW. And that became their primary role. I wanted to draw reference to having complicated this tried and true outdoor ed course by embedding this science module. We didn't stop there. We wanted to bring in one of our students who's a horse packer and have her bring her and her family out to pack the trip. So a, a student packed for us for one of our teams. We brought in Kyle Nikoloff from Wyoming PBS to start his documentary on climate change and glaciers in the Wind River Range. And to give my students the sensation of somebody else is interested in this. Not just me, not just CWC, but there's a greater audience who's interested in this. And another film instructor, Jeremy Nielsen. Um, the library, the library's a dying breed these days, or so it seems. We're losing the books, everything's electronic. Not at CWC. Our living librarian is also an instructor for the National Outdoor Leadership School. And we said, you will bring those articles, you will bring yourself, and you will bring this scientific methodology and this training into the field and we'll guide those students from day one through to when they publish. And then, of course, Darren Wells is the head of the outdoor education program at CWC, without whom this first year of research would have been very challenging. It was very nice to work in conjunction with him and with Jake Urban to get uh, the team out in the field. 
If you're going to mess with something tried and true and engage students in a foreign area, you need God on your side, or if not, at least a bishop. So uh, Ruth's father's a bishop, and we had uh, her father and mother at the last minute. The brother-in-law couldn't come, so we took her 70-year-old parents and all the pack horses, and with God on our side, I guess, we headed out 24 miles into the backcountry. So protagonists and a perfect setting. This isn't the perfect setting for everyone, and in, in part, that's what makes it a great story, is that not everyone can carry 60 to 80 pounds on their back and get into the Dinwoody. Not everyone wants to be doing on-the-ground mountain research at 11,000 feet. Not everyone wants to poop outside for two weeks. <laughs> but when my students seem grouchy, I try to expand on that and say, not everyone's back here. That's why it's special. Yeah, it's hard. Yes, the packs are heavy. Yes, the gear is heavy. Yes, we're tired. Yes, it's 11,000 feet. But not everyone is back here, and there's a reason. So chalk that up as something that builds your confidence in your abilities and uh, your capacity to perform while you're out here. In respect to our backdrop, there's been a lot of researchers before us. The Dinwoody has attracted a fair bit of attention, in part because it's accessible and in part because located adjacent to it is Wyoming's highest peak, Gannett Peak. So a lot of people end up traversing parts of the Dinwoody or camping at the base of the Dinwoody Glacier as they go back to Gannett Peak. Um, over time, it began to, uh, in the observational phase of scientific process, be observed that these glaciers are shrinking. The terminal moraine where the glacier used to be is no longer filled with ice. It's just a big rock pile. The actual terminus has shrunk, and the volume has decreased. So from 1996 to 2006 was one of the first major studies performed by Thompson and Al, and they came to the observation that there was a 39% overall decrease in surface area of the Wind River glaciers. That was followed up with a recent publication in 2014 looking at the volume decrease and the actual volume, not surprisingly, also has decreased considerably down from 1966 to 63%. So takeaway point, the Wind River glaciers are receding, not unlike the glaciers of the Tetons or the glaciers of Glacier National Park. And certainly land managers and individuals who monitor water are paying heed to this. We have these fantastic water storage areas at high elevations that are shrinking, compressing, and melting. And clearly the implications for that in states that are affected by this are certainly worth pursuing. How significant they will be ultimately depends at this point uh, on which specific glacier and which range you're talking about. But Wyoming, Wyoming is a headwater state, and we'll look at that in just a second. For those who've been into the winds, I know I spoke to somebody last night who spent some time on Mammoth Glacier, which is 15 on the other side of the winds. Dinwoody Glacier uh, feeds right into Dinwoody Creek. You go in through Trail Lakes Roadhead outside of Dubois. And all of the glaciers in this image were heavily studied, not through on the ground research, but through remote sensing and aerial photos. Not everybody has the time, energy, inclination, or money to spend that much time on the ground. So we use other tools that we have, but like every technology and like every research, what you want still is ground truthing. Dinwoody itself, rough approximations over the past 50 years are a 34% decline. You can clearly see one of the uh, lateral moraines down at the, coming from the side glacier on the far right hand side of the screen there. And there's plenty of places, if you go back in aerial photos over time, uh, which serve as consistent landmarkers that show you, without question, the terminus has receded. So why, why these students, why this research, why now, and why the winds? And I guess in terms of these students, they're what I have, they're my connection, they're my raison d'etre, they're my, the people I spend most of my day with, and when they shine, I shine. So they are uh, the biggest part of my social circle for the most part, and I want to see them successful. Why this research? It's contemporary. It affects Fremont County, it affects the state, it affects the nation, we're a headwater state. Why now? 
We're in the heart of the biggest conversation of our time, perhaps, discussing global climate change. Why the winds? Location, location, location. <laughs> and I guess we have many, many pedagogical discussions about meeting students where they're at and how significant it is that they text, so we should text. So I should give you all clickers, and I should ask a few questions, and you can click to me, and I can click back, and how I'll focus on what I'm going to say while I'm doing all that, I have no idea. But embracing technology and meeting students where they're at. And I, I, I totally embrace the use of tech, technology, especially geospatial technologies in my field. But for me, I wanted to meet students someplace else. And I wanted to make great use of the skills that I could bring and the passions that I have for the backcountry and the training and fuel that. And so my common ground for these students was to go to the hills. Now, of course, this is not Wyoming. <laughs> I'd be stretching the tail just a tad there. In this day and age, when you stand up in front of the classroom and six out of 10 students have laptops, which are acceptable, they probably have their textbook open, right? It's an e-textbook. Of course, they're reading ahead to check your facts. That's what they're doing. There's a constant battle to be more dramatic, more engaging, cleverer. And then eventually that fades and you say, close those now, please. I will not compete with whatever's on the screen, but there's great value in finding that which starts students on fire. And the title for this expedition, the Interdisciplinary, Interdisciplinary Climate Change Expedition, is my student's origin, and it is their fuel for this project that made me chase and chase and chase and chase until we actually pulled this off in August. And where it started for us was from a character named James Baylog. Are folks out there familiar with James Baylog? National Geographic. Um, a very talented and stunning uh, or producer of stunning photography who also came out of the field of biogeography where I started out and ultimately created a film called Chasing Ice. And on a gray, cold November day, I said, oh, what should we do today? What do you guys want to do? The laptops were flipping open. The Facebook uh, updates were happening. I'm like, close those. Today, let's go on a journey. Let's see what James Baylog can tell us about chasing ice. And let's see if we can find some, inf uh, some inspiration from without. Maybe it's lacking from within today. Let's tackle this. And give you a little taste of what James Baylog can do for a classroom. Just another humdrum class video, right? <laughs> Imagine 90 minutes of that. Now, of course, I can wreck a movie. I can stop it every five minutes and ask questions and talk about, is it spin? Is it science? I can really take all the fun out of watching a movie. But I let them watch most of this in, uh, in one fell swoop, in one setting. And, and you can't, as a science instructor, as a, an environmental science instructor, avoid or uh, not be willing to discuss every aspect of the conversation of climate change in your classroom. And within the first couple minutes of this film, we also get a nice intro to climate change discussion. Ultimately, within the first two minutes of this video, he pitches every argument you can have for and against climate change from death and destruction to uh, increased plant growth to political and uh, economic chaos. And from there, we chewed climate change apart. We discussed glaciers. Uh, we discussed changing temperatures as throughout the Rocky Mountain West over the past 30 years in particular and beyond. And from here, emerged the Interdisciplinary Climate Change Expedition. That one conversation in conjunction with James Baylog said, should we do this? Can we get time-lapse cameras? Can we go to the winds? Can we do science like that? And I said, well, why don't we try? But we're going to need a little money, and we're going to have to go in the chase. 
And we brought in many, many partners, Wyoming PBS, the Wyoming Center for Environmental Hydrology, NASA Space Grant Consortium, National Science Foundation, all our old friends at Knowles, and EPSCOR through UW. And we chased, and we sought, and we pleaded, and we talked to everybody in the film from Chasing Ice at INSTAR down at the University of Colorado and at UW, and we changed the face of science for these students. Pretty much got rid of that one. Science is not boring. Science is a chase, fueled by curiosity, inspiration, and motivation. Researchers are boring. Am not. Am not. Well, it won't stay white long in the field, but if you want to take a white fleece, go ahead. It's too hard. Science is scary. And and they're all full of crap and you never understand them anyways. We tried to dispel those immediately. And off into the Wind River range we, range we went. Roughly 680 snow and ice bodies, including 63 uh, still considered glaciers at this point. This is said best when it's said by my cohort who can imitate James Earl Jones and would say daily, from ice comes water. Daily, especially when the tent was flooded, from ice, Jackie, comes water. <laughs> a headwater state. What does it mean to be a headwater state? For my students, it meant nothing initially. If you lay out the water resource regions and go, look at the magic of this. The Great Divide, the Continental <coughs> Divide, that is the mountain range that we're talking about. The glaciers feed, respectively, the Missouri, Mississippi, the Green and the Colorado, the Snake and the Columbia, our water on the Dinwoody goes all the way, uh, hundreds of miles away down through the Missouri Water Resource Region. And our goal was to tap some of that water at its source, at the headwaters on the upper Dinwoody. Just to give you some frame of reference, from Dinwoody Creek down to the wind, down into the Bighorn River, and out into the Missouri Water Resource Region. If you're going to figure out how much water you have or how precious that water is, when some of that water is fed by ice and the majority is fed by uh, precip throughout the winter in the form of snow and some early spring and fall rains, it becomes pretty significant to folks to know how much ice we have. We can do quite a bit with aerial photos and remote sensing, but if you comb through the literature, they'll comment frequently, what you need is on the ground ground truthing. And it is not an easy process to get gear and students back into the backcountry to do that. This summer, we did some reconnaissance and feasibility studies using ground penetrating radar. We had some great successes. It works marvelously. Um, it showed us there's lots and lots of ice up to 11.4 meters where our capacity to go deeper ended. And we know that next year, we need to go deeper, take different equipment, and uh, still employ the same technologies. But these students now, when they hear the use of ground penetrating radar for archaeology and Stonehenge, have a connection to that. They know how to collect it. They know how to read GPR data. Mounds and mounds and screens and screens of this telling us we've got ice. So uh, tremendously successful in some realms, uh, less successful in others, we need to go back again. But essentially, uh, we're all holding microwave ovens, turning them on with the door open, and making laps across the glacier, which certainly sounds easy enough, except where we're at 11,000 feet. And this isn't the lab, and this isn't the front country, and you cannot get hurt. Not on my watch, please. And so, when we are looking at collecting samples of water from the glacier and from fluvial troughs in the glacier created by runoff, and students are roped up and being extraordinarily careful. Above all, although science is excruciatingly important, I want them to be safe. So down in the lower ice, students are not roped up here where we can see what lies below. Any place there's snow cover, we start to rope up our teams. And despite all of our best intentions, um, there's two things that happen on a glacier that are called inherent risks. That means unless you're extraordinarily negligent, um, they're considered 
risks of traveling in the backcountry. One of those is rockfall. And having lost several friends to rockfall, it's real. It happens. Not on my watch, please. And icefall. Now, in our situation, we didn't expect a Serac to fall. You actually don't expect that much on the Dinwoodie. It's used extensively by many organizations, including Knowles, traveled on a lot. But we did have a Serac fall. And it looks like nothing. It's just a little bit of white snow over there. Um, that's actually the size of a tractor trailer. So it was a good reminder for me, all impassioned about scientific methodology and students engaging and using technologies, that this is still the mountains. And not everyone goes here. And not everyone should go back there if they're not well trained. And a reminder to me of where I was and a little uh, communing with Newton. So what did we do out there? We mapped the terminus. We said, OK, at the simplest, whether we got a red cent in grants, we could take students back there. They could take a global positioning system, uh, a Juno or a Geo Explorer, something enabled with GPS capacities, and map the terminus. This is an interesting uh, little project, I suppose. You walk around the terminus. It's not terribly complex. But what aerial photos can't tell you is whether there's actually ice that has the capacity to store water underneath the moraine. So finding a true terminus for the Dinwoody is a little more than meets the eye. So something that had scientific merit that students could do without a ton of training. Um, the gal that you see in this picture is a GPS GIS whiz. From there, I wanted them to have the professional and academic ability to be able to go on and commune with other organizations, tell them what we found, and see if there was an element for them to contribute to greater estimates of mass and volume on the Dinwoodie. So these transects are combined with digital elevation models from the University of North Dakota, which will confirm and, uh, and put a new bit of information out there concerning mass of the Dinwoodie, and will lead to this student being able to publish in conjunction with the University of North Dakota for original research contributing to a master's research by another student. Not bad for a geo explorer and a trip to the winds. Okay, simple enough skill to be able to take GPS data and integrate it into a geographic information system and make a map, but not if you don't know how. Okay, the great thing about geospatial technologies is with a bit of training, you can go remarkably far. With no training, unless you're remarkably brave and or technically very adept, you stumble around tremendously. With a couple of courses and some hands-on experience, these students are ready to work in industry. They're ready to work in archaeology. They're ready to go on to UW, take some more courses, and do their master's research, much further than when we started. Something happened that was a little bit unexpected up there. And uh, although we had archaeology students hoping, hoping, searching, we made some great lithic finds up at uh, close to 11,000 I'm lying, 10,600 feet. So our archaeological students are on fire and uh, had nothing to do with me. It had to do with them being in the back country and finding lithics at that high. They will go back. They will cross over Bonnie Pass, which takes you from the east side of the winds to the west. And again, set themselves up professionally and academically for their fields in hopes of publishing and hoping to go on to UW and hoping to complete masters in some realms. Another facet we explored, in, in terms of climate change, we talk a lot about the term, the positive feedback cycle. You just can't turn it off. One thing begets another, and it just keeps going on. The same thing is predicted to be happening on the glaciers. A nice white glacier reflects the sun and the heat back. You get dirt on the glacier, just like dirty spring snow. It absorbs more heat. It exacerbates the rate of melt. The more melt you get, the more fluvial erosion you get, and the cycle goes on. And in conjunction with the American Climber Science Program and a gentleman named Carl Schmidt, we also engaged in a totally original project on the winds, which was snow sampling looking for carbon-based pollutants, asking ourselves, is there uh, evidence of carbon-based pollutants? If so, can we trace it? And is that a contributing factor to glacial melt? And I don't know if any of you are familiar with any of the, the loves. Probably many of you are. But um, uh, Several years ago at this point, I believe, um, and I mix up the loves, Charlie, I believe it was, published saying, you know, I think there's more to the picture than just warming temps and changing precip. I'm curious about the influence of pollutants in the winds, and is there any chance that those pollutants can exacerbate melt? Um, this has been done extensively in South America, but this is the first time students have been exploring this in North America, and the first time this research has been done. It began as a citizen science project, and as uh, 
extended much beyond that. Traditional in this field, if you're going to talk about water quality and water quantity, you want to know what you're starting with. It's a great skill the DEQ uses and environmental engineering firms use it. To give students hands-on field sampling experience in water chemistry is a great skill. What did we discover? The water is healthy. That's great. It's very indicative of what we thought we would see. There's not a lot of nitrates. There's not a lot of phosphates. There are some interesting changes in the macroinvertebrates, though. In the biotic community of what we refer to as bugs and insects in that stream, though. And one of our students, who is an ace fisherman, um, will continue to work with UW and with Western Community College, looking at what we found in respect to macroinvertebrates, how the community is changing as those streams lengthen and the glacier recedes, and the implications that has for fish species in general, uh, watershed ecology. So the Great Divide. The Great Divide for me is west and east. Does the water flow this way? Does it flow that way? It's the great divide between students engaged and inspired and watching you and chomping at the bit to talk to you after class and wanting more, going farther, and being lost in the system. It's the divide between scientific theory and discussion and scientific application. It's the divide between uh, one side and the other on climate change and students having a role in hands-on investigation that makes them feel involved in a topic that seemed esoteric. And in respect to the denouement and where this story ends, we have funding for the next two years. We'll go back into the Dinwoody. And what it happened this summer through embedding created a pure science team that we'll take to focus exclusively on scientific research next summer. So they're trained, they're ready to go. We'll go back in doing archeological, glaciological, uh, geospatial and hydrological research. And then the following third year, we will again embed in a new course of new recruits in hopes of inspiring and taking them across the Great Divide. Thank you. Yes. What kind of background do we have to have in order to be able to be chosen to go on one of your trips? <laughs> Initially, uh, a very positive attitude, a willingness to pack like a mule, and uh, some, some decent sense for keeping yourself alive is helpful. Um, some willingness to read uh, some scientific journals also helps. For my, uh, my, my root crop, my first year, I wanted engaged students who were willing. And, and I wrote that into the job description. They had to apply for the job, they had to go through HR, and I said, these, these are the top four requirements. You will maintain a positive attitude. You will not whine. It is a waste of time and energy. You will work endlessly hard, and you will make the maximum use of this experience. Those were the top four requirements. Beyond that, I said it'd be nice if you had a wilderness first responder, if you had some glacier travel, the rest. And, and I, should, I should reframe this, though, however, that many of these students I've had in other classes with me. So I've already taught about six of these students and now the other four I have in this semester. So it, it wasn't my first exposure to these students. Did I answer your question? Other questions? Getting new equipment or looking deeper to see? We will. We'll continue to work with UW. So that equipment was provided uh, to us through UW. And, and I think that GPR uh, comes in between thirty dollars and $50,000. And the University of Wyoming generously allowed us to pack that on mules, one which flipped. <laughs> and only dented the coffee pot and um, take that into the backcountry. So we'll continue that relationship with UW, but we will use some of the seed money from EPSCOR and NASA to also rent some other gear that will give us uh, more in-depth detail. And what we're looking for on the glacier is trying to find where that bedrock is. So there's many, many models. There's the bear model. There's complex mathematical models, models that take uh, topography and elevation and geomorphology and say, this is how much ice is there. What my students can bring to the table is, with 20 students in the backcountry, I can get them to walk laps of almost every inch of the glacier. And we can say, yeah, the model's great. Or you know what? The model's off. So. Uh, did you leave any equipment to monitor? Fantastic question. We're working in the Fitzpatrick Wilderness Area, which means no motorized vehicles, very strict requirements. Uh, we were heavily permitted and uh, maintained strict adherence to our permit. 
What we had hoped to do, and at the fundamental core of this where we began, was GPS data and time-lapse cameras because James Baylog and Neil Humphrey from UW, who designed his cameras for him, um, had my students' hearts on fire about leaving time-lapse cameras. Not so easy in the wilderness. We've started that process for next year. We would like to leave little time-lapse cameras about this big buried in Cairns. That is all we're hoping to leave for next year. What we would love, and it'll take tremendous uh, cooperation and in concert with the Forest Service, is to be able to leave temperature sensors and uh, if, if our dream was really big, uh, anything that could help measure ozone and CO2. But it's it, working in the wilderness area, 50 years of wilderness this year, we abide and listen to what we're told. Uh, Do specifically your courses teach about fundraising and collaboration among all these different agencies? Nope, that happened outside, and uh, I learned a fair few tricks about guiding students. Uh, these students all had to write resumes and participate in the grant writing process with me, so I took them along down the road of terror of, will we get it, will we not, will we get it, will we not, oh my god, we got it. Uh, and we just had some of that grant happen uh, two days ago. So we all rejoiced, and the expedition had already come and gone, and I borrowed from the CWC Foundation, and I said, I promise you, we're getting this money, and we did. <laughs> but I took them down that trail, and I wanted them to understand that's part of the chase, and you don't get credit for it, and I will not pay you for it. You just have to want it badly enough to do it. So we went through it together. They wrote with me. Yes? What was the biggest problem and or hazard uh, rockfall in August, those slopes as the uh, temperatures are high, we probably were 85 a couple days in a row, you get a nice glean of water on the glaciers and rocks move. So you hear a lot at night, things coming down, and it takes some, some very tight risk management. We work carefully as a team amongst uh, the American Mountain Guides Association, Knowles instructors, myself, and our, our living librarian who's also a Knowles Mountaineering instructor to really monitor tightly what we do. The second, which is a highly controlled risk, is glacier travel and, and crevasses. That is a highly mitigatable uh, risk, however. You rope up, you teach students how to do uh, an arrest and how to rescue from a, a crevasse, and that's very manageable. Rockfall and Serac fall, the surprise for us, uh, ice fall, are our two biggest, uh, biggest risks that we face. Yes. Do you anticipate being able to study any other species beyond the, the insect species, like the pica? Do they live at 11,000? Absolutely, pica are there. For now, we're pretty preoccupied just with the hydrological and the geospatial tech elements of this. Um, the macroinvertebrates will continue to focus on. Beyond that, if we were to expand this into any other species, it would be to monitor tree line and to look uh, as, as global circulation models predict changes in precip, less during the summer months, and warming temperatures, what will happen to tree line in the winds? Highly manageable for students to monitor and of relevance, and certainly under great scrutiny in Glacier National Park right now. Other mammalian species, probably not so much, not at this pa at phase. Thank you. Yes? Did you do any ice core sample to check CO2 levels or that will start next summer. So great question, and I forgot all about uh, reciting the question. My apologies. Did we do any core samples? We did not this year. We had, I guess, our hands full um, for this season, but we are very interested. In terms of a resource, you know, James Baylog's talking about when it's gone, it's gone. The record that we can pull out of those cores in respect to CO2 and, and ice, uh, ice dating and aging is phenomenal. Once it's gone, it's gone. So that is our next goal. And there's been some work done on the Fremont Glacier. We very much would like to dive into that realm next summer. <coughs> getting them out is, uh, is a work of art. When you talk about a runner team, if you're really trying to get ice cores uh, out of the mountains from 21 to 27 miles back, when you're not allowed to bring in motorized vehicles into the wilderness area, is complicating uh, for us on the Dinwiddie. But there's other glaciers where we could look at it as well. Great question. Can you just talk a little more about what we know about Yes, yeah, so from 1996 to 2006, uh, Thompson and his team did an extensive study using aerial photos and remote sensing. And I would say they probably wrote the book for the winds in terms of glacial recession. And I would dare say at this point, 
consistent up to you know 66 percent loss of volume and 39 percent loss of surface area. That's the average for all of the winds. The Dinwiddie was actually predicted to be gone by now. That didn't come to fruition, but over the last 50 years, reducing roughly in 34 percent surface area. All of those um, calculations, for the most part, are based on air photos, remote sensing, and modeling. What we don't have uh, is on the ground ground truthing of each of those glaciers. So the big picture, you bet, they're receding. I'm not sure there's any exceptions of the 44 that they sampled. There might be two that had one growth year in the middle of that 1966 to 2006. But in general, the, by and far, the trend was recession and very loosely stated in the analysis of these reports was uh, due to increasing temperatures and uh, change in precipitation. The two things that you have to have to form a glacier are precip, snowfall, and the temperatures to hold. Yes? Were there any scientific findings from this first exhibition that were surprising to you? Um, <coughs> Question. Thank you. Were there any scientific, or were there any findings from this first expedition that were surprising to us? We were a little high in black carbon for being as remote as we are. We meet classic sort of what exists right now for North American standards for black carbon deposits, product of combustion. For being in a remote wilderness area, we were on the outer edge of that, and that's something that we definitely want to explore more in terms of black carbon pollution. Uh, beyond that, did we find tremendous surprises? Our basic premise is that with glacier recession, stream lengthening, warming temps, we're going to have changes in water quantity and quality. And we know in respect to water quantity that it does impact, sometimes increasing water quantity, because in a warm year, you've got more melt off down below. Um, but a lot of this will take several years of baseline data in comparison to take it where we want to go. In response to your question, maybe no major surprises, but we still have lots more work to do in the black carbon analysis for certain. Yes? The, the, the amount of black carbon hint that maybe before so much of the snow has already been um, melted that there was more pollution there? Well, what we're trying to do through the black carbon analysis is source of, is it from forest fires? Is it anthropogenic? Is it through uh, combustion, through engine combustions, cars, vehicles, industry, et cetera? Um, and trying to discern that from accumulation of dust and see what darkening of those slopes can exacerbate and create that positive feedback cycle of glacial melt. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yes? What does the evidence about human existence mean? Does that mean that there's a cyclical pattern and that the glaciers weren't as extensive as they later became? Because since you were able to uncover that human evidence, it, seems, it just seems interesting. So what are, the, what are the implications of archaeological finds at this elevation in respect to cyclical climate change patterns? Um, I might quickly get out of my realm of expertise here, but I can tell you that these glaciers are associated with the Little Ice Age, predicted to be anywhere between 1,500 and 3,000 years old. So we're anticipating that archaeological remnants that we find that demonstrate natural resource use or inhabitation of these areas happen sometime <coughs> within that time frame. In the bigger picture, going back historically, I would quickly get out of my realm. But what it does demonstrate to us is certainly humans lived and traveled higher than we used to look for them. And anybody who's been into this area and gets onto the Dinwoody, you can't help go, but what's over the other side of the pass? So the next quest will be to see what remnants we find of prehistoric uh, archeological remnants for going over Bonnie Pass to the west side of the winds. And was this a human pathway that has not been explored? So our archeological team are very excited, but I quickly get out of my realm of uh, capacity to address questions on that one. Did I answer your question now? Yes? In terms of watershed, in a given year, how much of it is glacial melt, how much is snow melt? It varies across the winds, anywhere between 2% and 13%, and it depends on the year. So some of the glaciers, some of the smaller glaciers especially, 
not a fantastic contribution. At 13% though, and this is based on rough correlations of mass volume and uh, watershed gauge analysis through the USGS and other partners, um, once you hit up to 13% and several of our glaciers are much higher than that, does that 13% make a difference over the next decade or two decades or three decades? And it starts to be much more significant. So the averages from two to, th the range from two to 13, uh, depending on which glacier, there are a few outliers outside of that as well. So um, you can get both sides of the story. I've talked with researchers at UW who say, you know, we didn't really find what we thought, that we'd see such a tremendous contribution. And from the other side, you could say, mm, but 10% going through the Wind River Indian Reservation right now is a big deal. And that's 10% that people will be highly monitoring and concerned about in respect to habitat and human use and irrigation and industry. So, yes? Uh, do you think that as the scientific or safety scientific analysis for drones or do I think there's any application for drones? Um, oh, there's all kinds of miraculous things you could do, but I will 100% be towing the party line of abiding by Forest Service permit requirements in a wilderness area. When I'm back there as a civilian and I'm climbing, I would be extraordinarily disgruntled to have a drone bomb me on Gannett Peak. I would be extraordinarily disgruntled to have them in my camp. And so we're very conscious of that, even in respect to leaving equipment. If we're to leave our time lapse, they will be carefully cached and they'll be up on the upper slopes where rope teams go to position those as discreet as they could ever be. Um, so do drones have fantastic scientific applications? Absolutely, especially in the geospatial information science and tech realm. In our world, in the wilderness, place, in the wilderness Fitzpatrick and other, not so much at this point. Uh, in addition to the research that, that I'm engaging in as a, as a newbie, essentially on the research front with CWC, Todd Gunther, our resident archaeologist at CWC, takes students out and employs them in the summer doing projects for the BLM. So their little eyes are very well trained and they saw things that I would not. They essentially just kept combing the sides of the trails whenever they stopped for breaks. Those guys dropped packs and hustled and did that much uh, of their own initiative and started finding uh, lithic after lithic after lithic. So. Yeah, I was just curious, did you find any um, surprises in just the human behavior of your students, like any student that, you know, you expected to behave one way that, you know, surprised you in some way? Just curious if you discovered anything about, about behavior. So essentially does putting students in a, in a, a rough uh, physical environment under duress and getting them tired and keeping them up to climb peaks and work, does it uh, present with any interesting group dynamics? Um, it always does. It always does. People get tired and they get cranky and their fuse gets a little shorter. And I would say happily, uh, many years of leading groups with the National Outdoor Leadership School, um, you've seen it and that you're part counselor, uh, part argument mediator, part feather soother, and part scientist. Uh, significant surprises? People are going to get short. They are. They're tired and they're underslept and they're often dehydrated and working at elevation is tricky. No tremendous surprises though, other than I was delight, delighted that students, um, they summited Gannett Peak the day before I put them to work. And the greatest surprise was that 8 o'clock the next morning when that team was supposed to go to work, everybody was on time. So I was inspired by that. That was my greatest surprise. I kind of had a We'll see how this goes. And they were tremendous. The only surprises were positive. Uh, yes? Is there any pattern in the background of your students? Any pattern in the background? Mm. So do I see consistent characteristics of these students? I would say I have a very mixed crew. Some that are stellar in the classroom are just as stellar in the backcountry, and some that have stars in their eyes about James Baylog and National Geographic and being a photographer find the reality of the work involved maybe a little more than uh, it seemed like on television. But I think that the one passion they mostly all share is a true love 
for wild spaces and, and a real infatuation with adventure. And in terms of finding common ground and meeting them where they were at, as someone who is, uh, as an individual or within groups, always been in pursuit of adventure, that is something I can provide them with. We can turn this, we turned every element into an adventure, from finding funds to spending them to getting our mules and our horses in the backcountry. So I think they're fueled by the chase and adventure. Thank you very much.